Welcome, everybody, and welcome to the panel. Thank you for joining us and all of the people online. We're here to discuss the dance floor is a political space. And just in case anybody like me was wondering how do we get from politics into this beautiful science venue, <laughs> politics is in fact a science, but what I learned was it's an observational science, not an experimental science. So in simple terms, that means that no experiments, just research and observations of behaviors to create theories of politics. And we will start with introducing ourselves with the people that are here to discuss these theories with me. Sarah. Hi, Steph. Hi. <laughs> um, glad that I can be here. Uh, my name is Sarah Farina. I'm a DJ, producer, and activist, and I'm a co-founder of the uh, platform called Transmission with Dr. Kerstin Meissner, who's a researcher, and Transmission aims to make the political and historical relevance up of club music, rave culture more audible and visible. Thank you. Nice to have you. Catherine? Hi. Um, as well for me, nice to be here. Um, my name is Katharine Arendt. Um, I'm right now part of a club commission. I'm heading there the department called Awareness and Diversity. So it's an apartment department that is concerned on how to make like club culture and clubs like more diverse spaces and yeah, especially how to yeah change structures towards this. And my background is I used to work um, in different cultural spaces, um, industrial spaces that were like reused to club spaces, uh, for example in the Alte Münze and I used to organize several festivals before, before I started to work for the club commission. Welcome. Sebastian? Hi Steph, I'm very glad to be with all of you here. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Sebastien Tremblay, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the FU Berlin uh, in the Cluster of Excellence Contestation of the Liberal Script. I'm a trained historian, uh, I work on uh, collective memories in the transatlantic world, so like Germany, the US and Canada, and I look at social movement, especially LGBTQI plus uh, movement and how uh, our memory is also constitutive of like what we are uh, today. And I'm very glad to be here today because before I moved to Germany and before I became an historian, uh, I was also part of a collective in Montreal in Canada uh, having a club. Uh, so uh, we were having a metal and punk club mm -hmm. in the middle of the city. So, Excellent. Welcome. And I'm Steph C. Um, I run a company called Music Matter and I am an artist, a label, and an event manager. Um, I do a little bit of mentoring. Um, I do a lot of business consultancy um, and all pretty much mainly concentrated in the music world. And apparently today I host a panel. <laughs> 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 okay, so we've all come together because we plan to share our experiences and our opinions on club culture and the fact that Berlin and other comparable cities have sounded the alarm over the disappearance of alternative spaces and clubs um, as a symptom of fundamental change in urban society. So basically we're going to delve into what does it mean for liberal societies when such places disappear, become less access accessible or marginalized? Do they have to be designed? Can a society afford to lose such spaces? What can it do to retain them? And in addition to artists, activists and audiences, what role can scientists, politicians, or industry play? During our talk, we all come from totally different worlds, so some of the definitions might differ. So we're just going to cover a few of the words that you'll no doubt hear repeatedly, just so that you can hear what we actually mean when we use these terms. Mm. So some of the words are, that you'll probably hear a lot is community, scene, dance floor. So I'm going to start with Sarah. Mm. As someone heavily active in the music verse, do you agree with the statement that a community includes people of all ages, including elders and kids, and a scene doesn't? And if you don't agree, or you do agree, <laughs> what do the two words actually mean to you? Yeah, that's a good question, because I think often those terms are used in the same way, but I think they mean something different from each other. And community is what you just mentioned, like, you know, like an um, inclusive group where we focus on the collective well-being and we center the most marginalized people. Um, because when they're doing fine, everyone else is going to be fine as well, in my opinion. And the scene is more like um, about 
ego, economics, and more strategies, you know, and not really like, it's, it's more about the individual, I believe, so I think that's, that's the difference. But I think a scene can come together as a community sometimes. Okay, what do they mean to you? Um, I agree with Sarah that I think um, they are often used in the same way but mean something different. Um, for me, actually, I think that a scene is a bit more wider phenomena than a community and a community can be part or is a part of a scene. For example, when we think about a club, um, I think a club space, no, whatever it might be, is always like um, connected to a certain community and is made, yeah, yeah, around there you can find a certain scene which is like made, for example, out of artists, producers of the space and the crowd, which then can come together as a community, but it's like different things. So one community could have different scenes, yeah. basically. I think so, yeah. Okay. Sebastian, anything to add? Um, I mean, I basically agree with everything you just said. I would just add that a scene is also sometimes very important for the biography of some people. So if I look at my past and I look at the metal scene in Montreal, for example, it was also my way of meeting other people on the margin in, in the city and also then enter a community. I really like what you just said, but I think a community can also be part of an exclusionary process. So like a community is definitely something that brings people together in solidarity in one direction, in many direction, but it also excludes de facto other people, so especially if we think, for example, the community of the nation or community. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about a we, we also talk about a them. Mm -hmm. So I think there's also a problem there, but mainly it, it is about solidarity and it is about fighting for something. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you say that because for me, I think I've always used the word seen as something that's quite closed and quite cliquey, whereas community to me, it's much broader and it's more, more open. Mm -hmm. um, and then the dance floor. I know it seems a very simple term, but what does the term dance floor mean to you, Catherine? So for me, the dance floor mm, is actually a field of experimentation and it's the core of club culture and the core of a club, but it can, can present itself in various ways, I think. Um, but yeah, it's kind of an arena of self-expression and movement. Anything different to that? What I love what you, you just you? said. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think for, for me, um, it is space, of course, but it's also communication. So for me, it's, it, it shows how communication is not necessarily only with words, but also with bodies. And just the fact of uh, having a dance floor or having the possibility to go to a dance floor uh, is a privilege, but it's also a way of communicating with other people. And I think like when we're dancing in the club in Berlin uh, or elsewhere, we are communicating with people without talking to them at all during the whole evening. So for me, it's mainly bodies and communication mm -hmm. and fun. <laughs> and fun. You remember your first memory of dancing? So dancing has always been part of my life. So I've been dancing ballet since I'm three. Uh, so I don't know where... Uh, my mom would probably say before three, but I started my, my classes uh, when I was three. Um, so I don't know really. I think like my body has always been used to dance in, like, in a way of taking space and taking up stage. But uh, what stage and what dance floor? Are we? We're going to talk about it today. But so yeah, I don't really remember. It's just it has been part of my life all, all my life. Do you remember your first time? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't. But <laughs> well, I love everything uh, everyone just said, and uh, I love that a dance floor can happen anywhere. Yes. Most of the time, you know, it's like you just, for me, you just need a nice sound system. And that also, I'm claiming a dance floor can be a form of resistance, you know. And I'm always sometimes thinking, like, what was the first dance floor ever? And I think there's, I think uh, Kerstin Meissner, my friend from tr Transmission, she always says that there's probably no culture that hasn't invented dance or music. So and sometimes I'm thinking of, like, humans back in the days, like, really, really long ago. Uh, they were maybe drinking ayahuasca and dancing around a fire. Maybe that was the first dance floor. I don't know. It's true. Um, I know of somebody who did ayahuasca. <laughs> 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 and it's really interesting that you say that because actually you almost feel like it's internal. Mm. You actually, you know, the, the dance floor actually doesn't even need to always be external. I really felt the music I <laughs> give away. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, really felt the music inside, and I actually felt like I was dancing inside, which was a really unique experience. Mm. Any first memories of dance? Yeah, so I just started to think about it now, and I tried to remember, and I... Yeah, I mean, it's really strong in my mind still. I think I was 14 or 15, and like I'm, I'm coming from a very small town in the Middle Eastern part of Germany, um, where like club culture was a very different thing. It happened in really like abandoned places, bunkers, and um, really under the surface. So I, w I remember I was 14 or 15 and I sneaked in with friends uh, in, in such like a bunker um, away from, uh, in a village away from my town. And I wasn't allowed to be there. I really sneaked in because I was like way too young. And then um, they had like house music playing and techno music playing. It was like the first like experience with that kind of music for myself and I was like totally amazed how it went into my body and how I would like became one with the room and felt like high on on sound and like the vibrations so it was really strong and yeah I think it made me like passionate about club culture until today yeah so again something that connects us all obviously everyone's very passionate about the the music and dancing and that actually brings me on to, through history, we've had so many instances of dancing and the spaces that allow community expression actually being banned. You know, Kaipaira, ring dances during the slavery times, the illegal waves of the 90s, and of course the Nazi era in this wonderful clubbing capital that is Berlin. And today in the current COVID pandemic, of course clubs and dancing was the first thing that stopped. And it's been the last thing that we have seen come back, despite an industry of 4.8 billion. Please don't quote me on that number. Um, <laughs> Sebastian, why do you think that we are constantly having to defend the relevance, despite, despite the cultural, financial, spiritual and physical benefits that we all just discussed? Yeah, I'm, re I'm very happy, Steph, that you were talking about. Um, so ring dance and capoeira. Uh, I think I just want to make first like a small, um, a small comment about the country where I come from. So I think that when we talk about the liberal state or we talk about the nation state and we talk about freedom, it's always very important to talk about whose freedom. Um, so I come from an ongoing colonial project. So ca Canada, since its, since its start in 1870 when the constitution was created, uh, excluded uh, First Nations, Métis and Inus from, from the, the borders of the liberal state. And so they also banned dancing and they banned a whole bunch of stuff, but they also banned powwows dance and, and those kind of stuff. So even if the state, Canada is always being presented as some kind of you know, model for the liberal state, it is also ingrained with the freedom, but also the non-freedom of others. So I just want to point that out. Uh, before I say anything, but I do, I do think that we can learn from history. When we were discussing um, the panel before uh, we met for today, uh, we we're talking about how sometimes we're stuck in the present. So there's a fight in Berlin right now, but this fight is also connected to fights in the past. And if we want to, if we want to look at the future and want to create some kind of new utopias, we also need to look at the past. And I think we've seen that a lot in COVID time. Uh, I think tropes that were used before, and we're going to talk about the Weimar era a little bit later, but um, tropes that were used before are used nowadays. So things that are always associated with the margin or associated with only pleasure and hedonism is always the first thing that goes. And then we have tropes from, you know, the 20s, like this idea of venereal disease or these ideas of like, oh, but like we should not close, we should not reopen clubs because uh, if we reopen clubs, like disease is going to spread again, like the way people talked before COVID about Kit Kat Club as well, for example. So it's, it's also interesting that, you know, open office spaces have been reopened like much faster than brothels or that clubs. And so there's something here about who's in society is considered to be contributing, if, if we talk about capitalism to, to the economy, but wh what is actually presented as an integrative part of society and what is just considered like pleasure and hedonism. So I think it's very important to look at the past in order to to understand those kind of things. And what is illegal and what is accepted and what is not accepted is also something that is always connected with the past. So history, I'm, I'm preaching for, <laughs> for my own profession, obviously, <laughs> but I think history helps us understand those things. So do you think history is also responsible for why we're still fighting? Do you think we're just not learning 
from history because I hear you say history is important, but why does it keep repeating itself? If it's, that was the message in 1920, and here we still are. I think we, we can see that in two directions. I, I don't think that history definitely repeats itself, and I sure hope it will not if we talk about the <laughs> 1920s and 30s. Um, but we can learn, there's, there's, a, there's a possibility to learn about some things connected to history. So I don't think the things are always going to be the same. I don't think, for example, there was the Eldorado in the Weimar era that was a little bit like the bad guy of, of the time. I don't think that, that the same thing would happen to the bad guy, for example. I don't think that um, we're living in the same space as Babylon Berlin, for example. But we can learn from the past, and we can learn from people who fought, not only from destruction, but we can also learn from people who banded together, created a community, and actually fought for something. And Berlin's very liberal, known for that. Can a society less, if a society less liberal, sorry, is a society less liberal, can't read my own notes, interesting, <laughs> is a society less liberal if it has less liberal spaces? That's a very important and interesting question. I guess it would depend on like how we define liberal, which I don't think is something we're going to dive <laughs> we're going to dive <laughs> in today. Um, but I do think that it is lib if if we look at the liberal individual freedoms, I think it's very un interesting to see where we can have them and when we can create them. Sometimes they they pop up in spaces that we don't necessarily await. If we look at the GDR, for example, which was not a, a liberal state, you had like church basement, you had like places where people actually regrouped in order to create spaces and create fight. If we look at the LGBTQI movement, for example, in the GDR. Um, but ingrained in the liberal state, there's also the destruction of those liberal spaces. I mean, we see it in Berlin, gentrification is part of capitalism, is actually one of the mechanisms of the liberal state. So if we if we see the Meuterei or we see like Köpi and we see like those spaces that are being taken away, uh, it is part of of the liberal state. I would say. Yeah. Anything you two would like to add? Having heard that, um, I'm just overwhelmed by all the information. It's <laughs> 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 so interesting and so important. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So I'll just think about your last question, if a liberal city becomes less liberal, if it's losing uh, it's liberal spaces. spaces. Um, on one hand, I think yes, um, but it's hard to say that. And um, on the other hand, I think there will always be uh, liberal spaces somehow, because like people find their way to connect and to be progressive, but I think it's it really matters how hard people have to fight in order to create these conditions and how much energy is left to be really like progressive and think forward and create new stuff so i think like taking away these spaces it's like really um, in some way yeah speeding down the development because I think you're really right there. It diverts the energy totally. Mm -hmm. You can survive, but actually you could be doing much more yeah. if you had that energy. Um, which actually brings me to what you were talking about, basements. You're saying people will find spaces. Um, you said something on our chats before the panel about kinship, which was a new term to me, um, but relating to the connections and the relationships that are basically formed on the dance floor quite often. Do you think, Sarah, that kinship can survive? It's sort of the same question, but that it can survive and thrive without the clubs where people go to be themselves? Mm. I think we've seen this in the pandemic that like, when club spaces are closed, that it's really hard for a lot of people because especially marginalized people have their families there, kind of, you know? And like, for me, the dance floor is a way to practice hopefulness that I'm like, oh, at least for a few hours, we can come together and we are treating each other in nice ways. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, I'm so emotional today. I'm on my period. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I just um, I'm emotional because like um, I don't understand how people are seeing so many bad things in club culture. I'm like, it's 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 so important to just be, you know. And and with music, it allows me to just be and and be my true authentic self without being in fear of. Um, having to experience any form of discrimination. And I'm talking about a specific kind of dance floor and club setting where we have values, where we um, focus on the most marginalized.
marginalized, so everyone gets to have that um, very beautiful experience. And then, and, and, and I think that's the most beautiful thing that can happen, that when people have that experience, the next day when they go back to their daily life, the things that I've learned on the dance floor, that they can take that with them and implement that into their daily lives. And it, it can make us a better people, I think. You know, and also just like this unity feeling that you can have on the dance floor. And also what you mentioned that, you know, a lot of the genres that people love so much, like house and techno, that has been so whitewashed, these genres or movements were often a spiritual response to circumstances that were often so brutal. It's resistance music, and resistance is joy, right? But like, people are also tired, um, so um, there's a lot of work that we need to be doing. And I think if anything, if you lose the spaces, it does bring people together more in a way, but you're unable to do it on such a big scale, whereas the dance floor helps us bring people in that are not in our immediate vicinity. Talking about how you make those spaces, you said you're talking about a certain dance floor and where you've created a comfort for people and everything's done equally. <laughs> so the design of spaces is really relevant and we're very lucky to live in Berlin and experience the vibes in so many unusual spaces that you don't really get in the rest of cities. Um, so Berlin is specifically, because you're working for the Club Commission, and lots of other projects. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about your work. Yeah, so maybe to start with what the Club Commission is doing, it's um, kind of an association that's um, working uh, for the interests of club culture and the actors of club culture and Berlin clubs. Um, and basically it's advocating. So it's advocating for um, conditions so clubs can still survive in this environment we are living in and existing in here in Berlin um, with all of these circumstances we already talked about. Um, and I mean, especially the pandemic, I think really brought to the surface how important it is to have kind of an advocacy for that kind of scene because it's coming from the underground and it's somehow still in the underground even though it's commercialized and so on. But there are legal parts, illegal parts and um, it's a very self-organized culture and it's really under the radar of um, the general public, I would say. And we could see this uh, in the pandemic that it just you know, disappeared and it was really important that so many people did um, amazing projects to kind of keep club culture visible, keep these spaces visible and keep all of the people and actors and producers in that scene visible. Um, and it's really different compared to other like spheres of culture, like institutionalized culture, where I mean we are here at the Naturkunde Museum, it's uh, heavily governmentally funded and that's amazing, but that's really like a huge difference when it comes to um, preserving that here and um, having a safe future. So yeah, so basically the club commission and I'm, I'm working for kind of, yeah, keeping that culture visible and make it uh, yeah, able to survive. Well, thank you for your work. <laughs> Out of interest, how big is the Club Commission and how long has it been established? Um, so we, we celebrate uh, at the end of this year, on December 2nd, uh, the 20th anniversary of the Club Commission. Wow. Which is crazy, somehow. Um, yep. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the idea started in the end of the 90s and became an association in the beginning of uh, the 2000s. And it's now, like... I guess the biggest uh, organization of that kind worldwide, like we have over 300 members wow. um, constituted out of clubs and collectives and uh, different people. And I mean, we are working in kind of, we have like an office team where we are basically like 20 people and we have like the same kind of amount of, um, um, yeah, an extended board and a board. Um, so we are all working together on things, yeah. Nice. Um, and I read that you were really heavily involved in the, the Alta Münze mm -hmm. being repurposed um, for cultural events. Um, maybe you could just touch on that a little bit more and also just cover the benefits and challenges, basically, of designing a space that is not meant 
for entertainment and for clubbing? Of course. So I think my work at the Alte Münze, so maybe to explain that, it's an, uh, it used to be an abandoned old uh, coin mint. Uh, they used to produce like three different, uh, yeah, Währungen. Um, Currencies, yes. exactly. Currencies. Thank you. <laughs> and then they stopped working there in 2006 and then it got abandoned. No one took care of it. It's like a huge space. Um, overground and underground in the midst of the city and then um, me working in a collective we came from like working for festivals together came into that space and saw like a lot of opportunities but there was actually no infrastructure or anything it was just an empty abandoned space with a lot of potential and then we kind of yeah like grassroots like worked throughout the different rooms and just created stuff in order to be visible and then to convince like the state that we can stay there and this was like kind of a puzzle from one room to, to another and we tried to make work like different disciplines of culture so like uh, studios um, concerts but as well like club events and trying to create a club which then led me to my work at the Club Commission because I really realized we need advocacy and we really need people to uh, fight for this culture to stay in the center of the city. Um, yeah. It's a very nice story. <laughs> How long did it take? It's still going on. I mean, it's now one of the... So maybe that's the interesting thing. So no one would like talk about that space that much uh, in 2014 when we got there. And then when people start to do work in a space and then more people are coming and then it's coming to the surface and then suddenly a lot of actors and, you know, like stakeholders are interested in spaces because actually it's an amazing and one, yeah, one of the last real huge buildings that have potential in the city. And then we came into this whole like political process of, okay, now we have to prove that we are allowed to be here, that we do import work because there are all these other like profitable ideas that could happen here as well so it became a fight kind of you know like a cultural fight and it's still going on and um, luckily there have been like an um, yeah public participation process in order to bring more cultural actors there and like really look what's there what can stay and what can come and so this process is ongoing and really not at the end. Would you say one of the biggest challenges was what you just mentioned, basically capitalism and the it money is. that could come in instead? It is, yeah. yeah. And it's, I think it's really depending on what kind of government we have uh, and who is taking care of that issues. Any of you want to dip in on that? Yeah, capitalism. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure we have time to talk <laughs> about. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, always money. Well, it's actually really relevant to you because when I investigate what you're up to, mm. um, I was reading the bios on the two platforms on Transmission. Transmission says that the mission is to make the political relevance in history of international sound, club and rave culture audible and visible. Mm. And then Emergent Base, which I believe is your latest project from this year. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for, sh you, you posted to say thank you for sharing um, your extremely valuable thoughts with us and fighting to make club culture more enjoyable and safer, reminding us that coalitions in the German club music scene beyond Berlin between BIPOC and queer club music artists, DJs, collectives, etc., are so necessary. Mm -hmm. And in order to let culture, community and people thrive in sustainable ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you were talking about earlier when we were talking about spaces and survival. Were your platforms and your work of designing these spaces, is it because you felt it was missing? Yeah, I think that it always comes out of the urgency, right? And just like, wow, it's, it's no one is doing it, so I have to do it, basically. But of course, there are people before us, there are people fighting for those spaces and so on. And we just want to continue that at the end of the day. But fights, uh, they change from time to time. And the situations change and governments change. Um, so, yeah, with um, Emergent Base, for example, um, I was invited by um, Camille and Caro, uh, two music lovers. Uh, they had this idea of creating um, a new 
interdisciplinary um, event series called Emergent Base at Mensch Meyer, which is a very political club here in Berlin, to um, center the Afro-diasporic um, music culture and queer culture as well, like a space um, by us, for us, basically. Because, of course, my the next step will be to have a, a club for our own, just us, so we don't have to, um, you know, uh, collaborate. I mean, it sounds bad, but you know what I mean. <laughs> when you say us, you mean your collective yeah. that bring these things together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just like what, imagine, like this utopian uh, utopia club where it's run by uh, BIPOC people and queer people, and that doesn't exist enough, in my opinion, because often if you work in uh, white-led uh, or male heteronormative um, institutions, you'll hit a glass ceiling at, at one point, and um, it's 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 just very it makes you tired you know and it's it's interesting because since last year Black Lives Matter people are like kind of trying to do the work now I think but there's a lot of performance as well and you know I get that in some contexts <coughs> because it's like um, uh, you're trying to learn something new and then you perform maybe for a while until you really get it but I'm now at like those fake it till you make it yeah fake it till you make it. <laughs> But these fights have been going on for a long time and people really need to get their shit together um, to do better, you know? And um, it's kind of crazy to think about that George Floyd had to be mur murdered until we have a discussion about racism in Germany and it's still in baby shoes, this whole discussion. It also links to the whole history of Nazi Germany and people really not coping with the responsibility and all the things that have happened because it was an opportunity to, to deal with those things. Um, but there are wonderful people in the city who are doing amazing work for sure. And I think Emergent Base can be um, a space where we practice the things that we wish for already today, right now, in a way. Nice. And when you're when you're creating these events and these spaces, basically designing them to fit your needs, what's at the forefront of your mind? Um, it's li like you also said, like, you know, we're trying to educate ourselves with history to understand the now better in order to have a more inclusive and safer future. I think that's key. And it's also not like that our group uh, knows everything. We're also learning along the way. It's it's a kind of like we're inviting people into the process to learn together and not like being preachy about anything. And, um, you know, I spent some time in Detroit with Underground Resistance, who is like, Underground Resistance is a, um, a black collective, techno collective that is very political and they really um, activated my p political values even more than before. So that also really shaped me and I feel like I have this responsibility also to work in intergenerational ways to um, honor um, the people who have been fighting for us so we are n n uh, there where we are right now so I c we can continue the fight. And, um, you know, it's like about um, the, that we wanted to have an inclusive, diverse dance floor, but that also should reflect in the lineup and in the structure itself because um, we don't talk about the structures enough. It's, it's kind of easy to, to uh, curate a, div div a diverse lineup. It's very easy. But what about the structures, you know? Um, because we don't want to reproduce um, the harmful systems. So when you say structures, what, do you, what exactly do you mean? Like hierarchies, for example, or just like how we show up for each other or not show up for each other, how we talk to each other. It's like sometimes just microaggressions and we all have to uh, learn a lot of things, um, but it's especially marginalized people who really are being oppressed in systemic ways. And um, it's, it's weird because people love to go out to dance to our music, to our culture, but they don't do the work and don't understand where it comes from or don't honor it enough. They just want to have the good bits, basically. You know, it's just like there's this um, quote, like people love um, black culture, but not black people. You know, it's, it's, it's really sad. But I think it, it's also fun to learn about those things. You know, it's, it's, it makes you a better raver <laughs> to know where the music comes from. And the people behind the music and what kind of um, sp spirituality is behind it, you know, and how it like, and then we are back at the uh, uh, to the body topic, like how you can 
uh, get to know your body in different ways on a dance floor and with movements and so on. And especially if you're comfortable, right? If you're in a safe space, the way you dance exactly. is completely different to yeah. how you dance when you feel on edge or you're slightly uncomfortable. Exactly. And I think one of the important things is if you work in the music industry or in the club scene is to hold yourself accountable as well. It's always easy to point to others and like, you're doing it the uh, wrong way and, and so on. It's, it's important to hold other people accountable, but also I have to hold myself accountable as a DJ because I have a certain amount of power as a DJ, um, if you're in a certain amount of league, I would say, especially the elitist DJs, they, they play for a lot of money. I imagine if they would use more inclusivity riders when uh, they would have um, something like uh, in the riders that would say, I'm only playing uh, club gigs or festivals if you have that amount of non-binary people, trans people, women, BIPOC people in the lineup, otherwise I'm not playing. Or if you're a white DJ, for example, and you're playing Afro house music, you know, um, maybe there's a way that 10% of your fee goes back to the community. You know, I think it's it's kind of easy to be less shitty. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> and with your events, are you teaching people this kind of stuff? Is that why you've combined panels with an event? Because you're trying to talk to people about these things? Exactly. So Daniel Schneider from Archive of Youth Cultures in Berlin uh, and me were, cu we were curating the panel discussions. Like one of the topics was how um, black music culture has uh, shaped Berlin club culture, for example, with the GI disco uh, culture and so on. And those panels, for example, they're, they're all in um, Eng uh, German. Um, and we also had people who would translate from German to English to make it more accessible and just learn together at the end of the day. But also I'm at a point where, where right now, sorry to say this, where I question the f panel format. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. No, it's, it's been cancelled by one of the No, 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 no. <laughs> it's just we need more um, something that is interactive, you know, mm -hmm. where we really, because sometimes people just listen and they go home and then nothing happens. But I want to find more ways where we can actually do something and have like tools. You know, so we're thinking of ways at Emergent Base to um, uh, create different forms of coming together with the community. And yeah, talking is important. I love this. Yeah. Very <laughs> thankful to be here. But more action. Yeah, more action. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I actually have a friend who recently did a panel for um, October. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, she decided to do a quiz instead of a panel. Mm because she said in the panels we're just talking at people and we're just preaching mm -hmm. and the quiz was a fun quiz but it was so people had takeaway facts and could actually educate themselves mm. so i think that can be quite interesting but even though you're bored by the well not bored or yeah. questioning yeah. the panel um i really like the idea of going to events where i get a little bit more engagement mm -hmm. with the artists and the people that have put the dance on and you can have a chance for feedback right it's a back and forth conversation yeah. And these multi-purpose spaces, I actually wanted to ask you about this, Sebastian. Um, I read about a place called Mocha FD, way before my time. <laughs> Yours too, I'm assuming. <laughs> um, but it was a really extravagant, I don't know how many of you have ever heard of it, but it was a really extravagant, multifunctional space. Um, not with panels and dances, but apparently it had barber shops, <laughs> a bäckerei, <laughs> and even a room filled with typists for businessmen and journal journalists <laughs> if they needed to pause and work, because often it was two to three day parties. And I'm just curious whether there's anything to learn from these, these spaces or whether it's something that should be left in the past, combining activities. I think this is already happening in Berlin. Actually, that was one of the first things that struck me when I arrived in Berlin, that there was food in clubs and that there was, you know, <laughs> a possibility to, to stay, uh, tr like the party being a conversation and being a dialogue during a whole weekend in order to stay there, uh, sometimes with the help of something more than food, but like you have food um, in order <laughs> to sustain yourself. I, I think that, um, so this is an example from, from the 20s, right? From the, from the 30s, but... Um, I really like what you what you said before about, and you also mentioned it when you were talking about the bunker spaces. Um, there's there's places that were taken away during this pandemic that were really important for people, 
um, that so when we always talk when we talk about feminist theory, queer theory, and those kind of stuff, we always talk about the private being politics. But so, sometimes we we also forget that the the private, the home for some people, is also a place of violence, and it's not necessarily the place where they can you know fulfill who they are or actually like be who they are. And then places outside of the home become the private space where those people thrive. Right. So we have like chosen family. You were mentioning chosen family, and I think like clubs is that for a lot of people. And so staying a whole weekend in a club with food, with dance, with, uh, with multiple aspects, is not necessarily just party and just pleasure, but it's also family and it's also, I don't want to use religious term, but also a communion kind of, with like different kind of people. And I, it depends also how we see the dance floor, but for me the dance floor is not only dancing, it's also, when we talk about pleasure and desire, it's also sex. And I think um, when we talk about those things, sometimes we don't talk about sex, but a lot, of, a lot of the clubs in Berlin with dark rooms are with, you know, improvised dark rooms, are also spaces where people have orgies, have sex, are touching each other, and this is also part of, you know, people creating who they are and being part of who they are. So there's already multiple aspects of the dance floor. You can dance, but you can also, you know, you can have sex and you can kiss and you can flirt. And, and for some people, it's the only way that they can do this, especially if they just move to Berlin, for example. But we also have other spaces where, where people are mixing all those stuff together. If we, if we think about the Schwutz, for example, which is, I think, a very good example. People were so happy that it reopened <laughs> <laughs> last weekend. Um, but the Schwutz, I mean, some people don't know this, but it started in the 70s and it actually comes from uh, gay liberation and the Schwulenbewegung in, in, in Germany. So it, it started as a small space from the Homosexual Action West Berlin, which I think there's going to be a jubileum party in Schwutz in, in, in a couple of weeks to celebrate the 50 years. Um, of the Ha'avi, but this, this, this was a communal space from the beginning and then it moved to Kreuzberg and now it moves to Neukölln, but it, it is already a space where people were, were talking and, and Schwutz is doing so much political events. For example, Menschmeier is doing a lot of um, political informat informative events where you can learn about Antifa politics, for example, or you can learn about um, various aspects of things that are usually in academia. Uh, who are like share among people who are actually living those things, so like not talking about but talking with, and then afterward you stay in the club and then you just dance the the night away. So this is this is already uh, happening. And last point, I mean, there's a lot of like left wing spaces in Berlin who also offer food in different kind of ways, right? If we think about popular kitchen, all the house projects in Berlin who some of them were legalized, some of them are still not legalized, who are actually opening their doors sometimes more than once a week to offer food for people for like two or three euros, like um, so-called like Küfe, Küfe, Küfe für alle. And I mean, this is like in a society that is so divided by class, like Germany, um, it is very interesting to see like different kind of people kind of like meeting around food. I mean, maybe it's utopic and it doesn't work like this all the time. There's also processes of exclusion, but people are meeting to talk about food to, to eat food and then staying for an informative event and then why not for a dance party afterward. So I think this is still happening and it's very Berlin, I think. Very Berlin. I've never seen a barber, but I've definitely <laughs> seen yeah. a few things come together. Um, that's very specific to Berlin, but Sarah, you visited lots of cities and countries to share music, you teach workshops, and to collaborate with other artists and dance in their clubs. Have you experienced somewhere with an absence of the spaces that we've been talking about? So cities that just don't have it. Um, and what's the impact on the people there in the society? Mm, actually, I have to think of my own hometown. <laughs> I'm from South Germany. I come from a small town there, uh, which is like two hours from Munich. And so I grew up there. It's Bavaria, very conservative. You know, I went to a Catholic girls' school. <laughs> Just, it was a very intense uh, experience and they, I think they still have just one club and it's like a very mainstream um, club for teenagers, like sometimes you're allowed to get in when you're 16, like I don't know, Abi party, I don't know how to say this in English. Um, graduation, well not exactly yeah. graduation, but yeah, yeah and like finish school. Sp spring breakers, you know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, for from my perspective, not really a music culture or anything. It was just more about, I don't know, getting really drunk and I don't know. I just couldn't uh, connect with it. And uh, just really no music education, I think, just consuming, you know? And, um, and I mean, the Bavaria itself, just <laughs> it makes sense that 
<laughs> we had this kind of club and it, it hasn't really changed until now. So, yeah, that's why I'm here now. Has, uh, yeah. That was going to be my question. When yeah. you go home to visit, has it changed at all? Not really, I think. No, I've never played. <laughs> maybe played maybe I should do my own rave there. Well, that's kind of what was on my mind, thinking if the space yeah. doesn't exist, maybe you create maybe. it. I'm, I'm sure there are cool people there. there are, there's always a few people who um, uh, have a similar mindset, I guess. And now I'm here, you know, I mean, since a long time, but like that's, that was one of the reasons, because I didn't feel a sense of belonging. I think that's very... Um, uh, central to to club culture you have a a sense of belonging or what you just mentioned people feel like they're home and i don't didn't really feel home in that kind of club space but i've never really been to a place where there's no club culture at all i think we're also speaking about the specific kind of club culture here mm -hmm. right i mean there's also club culture with bottle service and vip area that's something else it's very much something else, <laughs> but very popular, mm -hmm. but not actually so much in Berlin. Not sure if we consider this club culture, I mean, that's mm. something to discuss, like, really. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe another time. <laughs> 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 but staying focused on the spaces, you've been really, um, well, this year, for anybody who's not aware, um, German Reunification Day, the 3rd of October, was actually repurposed. <laughs> <laughs> for Tag der Clubkultur, um, and you worked on that. And I'm just curious, in the climate of these worrying number of spaces disappearing, how did it feel in this time to unite and give a voice to so many artists and so many venues in support of Berlin's club culture? Well, first of all, I have to say we didn't, you know, like... Uh, we didn't change the day in the reunification day. We just uh, thought it's like a very good occasion to have uh, a day to celebrate club culture, especially when we look at the history of club culture in the city and that it really um, kind of, you know, like evolved in, in the time when the wall went down and like there were a lot of abandoned spaces and um, like a progressive culture could develop. So we just thought it's like, yeah, an amazing day to, to celebrate our scene. And so the Day of Club Culture is an initiative from uh, the Cultural Senate and the Club Commission and the Music Board. And it basically um, took place the first time last year. So in the midst of the first row of the pandemic and when really nothing could happen. And so basically in that October last year, the Day of Club Culture was the first day when really stuff could happen in clubs again under like um, certain measurements and circumstances, of course, but it was really the first day the whole scene could come together, could go back to their work, could um, hire their artists, present their own curated programs and express themselves and um, invite their crowd. And that was really what happened, like all the... It's like 40 places all over the city who get awarded with kind of an, yeah, prize or award of 10,000 euros. And it's really like something very symbolic. So like saying, we see you and we consider you culture and we um, really appreciate what you are doing to the city. And we as well acknowledge that without you and all of the people, uh, the city wouldn't be the same. So it was really like a political and symbolic act. And of course, like uh, financial help that was really needed in that time. But I guess it's really way more of, yeah, again, making the scene visible and appreciate it um, because it's really like an existential part of the city and the cultural life here. So last year was really... Um, amazing, like really like emotionally moving. And um, it's as well, you know, like a huge paradigm shift for the culture to be, um, yeah, considered by the Cultural Senate in Berlin, and which really means something because we have this issue that still we are kind of fighting in society for club culture being considered as a part of real culture. And of course, we all here are sure about that. And now, like, of like, thank God, like pol politicians as well. But still, in the common sense of society, we always have to prove that we are worth it and that we are really doing cultural work. So this was like a big, big step. 
And same happened this year. And as well, the focus of the Day of Club Culture is um, especially on the diversity um, of the actors in the scene. So the diversity of the clubs and their programs and their approach and the collectives. Um, and what kind of, you know, um, engagement they, they have in, in the society work and what kind of special ideas they bring to the city and moving it forward. So I think it's a really special and emotional thing and which made a lot of people very, very happy um, and being like appreciated the first time in their life for the work they are doing for so long. Did you feel that there was a difference because of the pandemic and everything that happened? Did, was there any more energy, like more momentum, because people had realized what it felt like to lose it and then come back? So it's really different how it happened last year and how it happened this year. And I remember I had a conversation with Sarah about it as well, because last year, as I said, it was really the first huge event when things in our club spaces could happen all over the city. So everybody was really excited, like the crowd and the people doing it, and they would like really just overwhelm all the places because they didn't dance for so long and they didn't uh, came together with their community especially. And you could really feel that, you know, like people were crying. And this year it was really like in the middle of a very, very stressful summer because things stopped for over one and a half years and then suddenly in June we could start doing things again, you know, in summer, open air, and um, suddenly a whole scene had to go back to work from doing nothing and having like a huge existential crisis and looking for stuff because a lot of people, you know, like found new jobs and we are looking in a whole different landscape now, but um, still we have to go back to our work and that's what we want to do. But yeah, suddenly from one second to another, we were there again. It was so like fast and powerful and there was no place and time and space for resonance and like feeling yourself and then in the midst of that stressful thing, the day of club culture happened. So I really felt this year it was even more important that we had off, um, something like a really crazy award show where we could all dress up, come together and show ourselves and um, hold a prize and being happy. And then it was just an add-on to have this like day of club culture on October 3rd happening, um, but it didn't have the same feeling as the last year, just because we were again in a different situation. So thinking now about it, um, and that's coming back to the talk I had with Sarah about it, we would reconsider it and maybe even making it a month of day of club culture or something like this, you know, because now we have all these stuff already going on, clubs are opening again, and we don't have the urge, you know, to reopen things for now. I mean, we really don't know in what future we are looking and what will happen in the next months and if we find, find uh, ourselves back in the situation again. It's very true. We've got no idea of what's going to happen. And also, I think that it's still very fresh, what's just happened. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, but it, whenever I think about like losing these spaces and what just happened, going back in history and talking about the Weimar Republic and the fact that Berlin had this amazing reputation, um, I actually read that there was a popular guidebook <laughs> to a lesbian in Berlin advertising readers that there was something for everyone in this city. Here, each can find their own happiness, for they make a point of satisfying every taste. So Berlin obviously already had that, but if you could tell us a little bit about having lost that and what it meant and how we've learned from that, or what's changed and what hasn't changed. Um, so Weimar has always been a big topic in Berlin, right? Even like when I look in the archives and I do look at things that were happening or I read, um, for example... Actually, exam sorry to interrupt yes. you, but for anybody who doesn't know what it is, maybe you could just... Yes, of course. ...one sentence of what period of time it relates to and what it... So we're talking about the period, uh, grosso modo, between the, the two world wars. So after, after the end of the German Empire and before the rise and uh, taking of power of the Nazis. It's called the Republic of Weimar because uh, the, the Republic was declared in Weimar, which is a town in uh, Thuringen, the center of Germany. 
Um, yeah, so it, it's called the Weimar era. <laughs> um, and when I look at the archives and I do work about, about this, this period, it's always fantastic to, to, to make connections with the present and basically look at the way people were talking about, uh, if, if you're crazy, you should go to Berlin because this is, this is where, it's, where it's happening. Um, but I think that we, we also forget the darker aspect of, of Weimar. So like this scene was thriving and there was a little bit something for a lot of people, I wouldn't say for everyone, but there was something for a lot of people. There was a queer scene that was also very big uh, in, in, in Germany at the time. Um, but there was also a lot of police raids. There was a lot of like uh, lists compiled by, uh, by the police forces. There was a lot of surveillance. I think there's a reason why the National Socialists were able to destroy a scene quite easily afterward because a lot of surveillance had always been taking place during that time. But I'm, what I'm very interested in is the memory of, of those things. I think this is how, what's really important for us today as well. So if, if, if I give one example, um, at Nollendorfplatz, which is a, a, a um, for those of us uh, of you who are looking at the live stream <laughs> and are not necessarily based in Berlin, it's a, it's a station in the middle of Berlin in the um, borough of Schöneberg. Uh, there's, a, there's a pink triangle on that station. Uh, it's a memorial to the memory of the homosexual victims of the National Socialists. And one of the reasons why this triangle is there, it was inaugurated in 1989, one of the reasons why this triangle is there is that Schöneberg was basically one a very important borough for, for the community back then. And there was a lot of clubs that were, that were there, like gay clubs, but also lesbian clubs. Uh, who got destroyed, and I think this commemoration of the destruction by the Nazis of those clubs is very important for many aspects, but one aspect that's very important is how we talk about this destruction. So usually when we talk about victims, like homosexual victims of the, uh, of the, of the National Socialist, we're talking about gay men, because there was a, there was a law that criminalized uh, sex between men, paragraph 175. But lesbians were oppressed as well, more structurally maybe, but they were oppressed as well. So that we commemorate the fact that lesbian clubs were also destroyed, show that we can also commemorate the more structural violence connected to fascism, the most structural part of power. And I think that is very important when we look at the past and we look at those culture. But we've been talking a lot about bunkers and abandoned places today, and I think this is also connected to this history and the violent history of Berlin. So the fact that we're allowed to have those spaces, that we have bunkers, that we have abandoned places, is a very wonderful thing, but it's also connected to a very darker past of history, right? It's, co it's connected to a history of oppression, of genocide, of anti-Semitism, of racism. And I think that is very important to take into consideration when we talk about survival of the scene. So there's a positive aspect of this survival. I really love that you said that joy is resistance. Like there is, there is something there, but there's also this violence that's kind of like connected to it. And I feel obliged also, because we're in Naturkunde Museum today, to also mention that this violence had also various aspects. And when we talk about the Weimar Republic, and we talk about who were guests in those clubs, and those, there was also a lot of freak show happening in those clubs. A lot of like, people who were shown as kind of entertainment. Exhibited. Exhibited, and usually those were BIPOC individuals who were also sometimes kidnapped. Um, and I think it's very important to talk also about who the entertainment was for who. And a little place for everyone, yes, but who was a freak and who was considered a freak. So. Do you think that those negative memories are also what helped cities survive or come back after that? Like, did Berlin, you know, recover? And is it the negative memories that, that feed it? I'm a, uh, it's not that I'm a very negative person, but I'm a huge <laughs> fan of how the negative can actually push us further. I think there's different way of looking at the negative past. We can just like look at how problematic it was or how, how it doesn't conform to some values that we have nowadays, but we can also see something to learn from it, right? And there's some aware of it and to be aware, aware of it. Like when we talk, for example, of queer politics, of LGBTQI plus politics, we're always kind of this in frame of like from shame to pride and from like negative to positive and going out there. But there's also something like very important and thriving at actually looking shame and pain and suffering in the face and actually learning from it. So I think club culture learns from its past and it's also very important. Anybody have anything to say to that? Yeah, just, uh, just um, I mean, it's a good reminder that we need to look at the past in order to understand the, the now better. It's, it's always the same, and um, yeah. I think it's a pattern that we very much see. It's kind of an arrogance of we can do it fresh, 
we can do it better without actually... You can do it better, you can improve, but how do you know what you're improving on mm. without going back and looking at what went wrong? Yeah. Yeah, but I think it has as well something to do with like the psychological immune system of people, you know, like to like really suppress and um, look away f uh, from stuff that is somehow uh, as well painful and look somewhere different. It's not very productive, but I think that happens as well. Like people tend to forget what is painful. It's kind of a survival yeah. technique or protection, more inner protection, so to not have to deal with it. And as well in the here and now, not just in the back and then, I think in the here and now, we as well have to thi always think about both sides. Like now we are like celebrating club culture here and it's something very beautiful that connects us all, but it has as well like the darker side, um, which because it is ingrained and embedded and in, in all over power dynamic of society in capitalism in social inequality and these are as well all the challenges we have to face as well in our spaces the beautiful they are yeah talking about that um so in terms of the spaces that we actually have already um with gentrification making us lose lots of them is there a chance to utilize the spaces that we have in the absence of opening new ones how do we make them safe spaces if you, I mean, you already do it with your events, but when you say, when you were talking about the structure and the setup, how do you make it what you class as a safe space? Mm. Yeah, I would, I would even um, say, uh, use the term safer spaces because a safe space is, it's not possible, right? I wish, but nothing will ever be perfect, you know? And um, I think a lot of the things have to do they have to do with ourselves. I think it's looking inward, even on a sp spiritual level, almost. Like, I think anti-racism work or anti-ableism uh, work um, is, is um, not, it's political, but also spiritual in a way, because you have to um, look at yourself and be like, oh, I did things wrong and maybe you, f you kind of feel your fragility of your ego because you, you feel shame and it's uncomfortable, but we only grow outside of our comfort zone, I guess. And you can do that by yourself, maybe by reading books and, and taking part in workshops or whatever. And I feel like there are different forms of being a more, um, what's the word, empathic, um, Empathic. Em empathic person. Empathetic. Uh, yeah, empathetic person. Um, and, you know, like with the Club Commission, you started the Awareness Academy, for example. You, you can talk about that later. Um, where there's now more structure and, and um, things where people can go to who work in the club industry to create better parties at the end of the day. Because I think if you know how to take care of people, in more sustainable ways, you will have better parties at the end of the day and more joy. And who is against joy? <laughs> I, 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 I don't, I don't, I hope no one, uh, but I'm sure there is. Um, and yeah, with, with Emerging Base, we also try to hold ourselves accountable. And for me as an artist, you know, I'm trying to look inward all the time and ask myself critical questions and they're uncomfortable. Um, but I think that's how I grow and find my authenticity. And sometimes I don't know the answers, but it's, it's important for me to know why am I doing this? Am I in there just because I want money and fame? <laughs> or is it for me about bringing people together from different backgrounds and um, sharing music with people? And you know, I, I describe my music as rainbow based because for me, music is a spectrum. and. I think it's also interesting in club culture that or in Berlin, uh, we have different floors and it's like the techno floor and this is hip hop. I'm like, why is this <laughs> genre segregation happening? Because we're also segregating people. And then there are hierarchies everywhere. And in my utopia, we don't think in those categories so much because they harm people, right? I know that to some extent, people need categories, but we also know how much harm they have been doing to put people in boxes and how we internalize those things. And I describe my music as rainbow, be ra rainbow based because space is the essence, right? It's what we feel in our body. It's, it's what makes, makes people uh, scream <laughs> when the bass kicks in. 
and it's something so universal that people react to with their bodies. And Rainbow, because for me, the different music genres that that are out there, they're all connected to each other, like the colors in the rainbow. And there's also queerness in there, you know, and music has traveled also for very terrible reasons like, um, you know, colonial history and so on. But there we are again at this point of, you know, that the, the genres that have uh, evolved out of resistance, you know, that is so joyful, like baile funk, for example, or techno and house music. Um, yeah, I think I lost my red thing, <laughs> the, the linear, it's but okay, you know you what answered, I mean. <laughs> you actually answered the question. Um, yeah. But talking more physically, actually, about retaining these spaces, because everything I hear from you is beautiful in terms of your crew and how you step into spaces and what you try and create. Um, but do the spaces that we already have have some responsibility to improve things? Because I don't think it's just the dance floor or just the collective that's hiring a venue. You know, what about the door staff? What about the actual management, the whole infrastructure of the space? You know, can we do better there to actually improve the spaces? And it, it brings me on to, to you, Catherine, because you were, um, you're always working in spaces, but also <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to, like, yeah, I'm trying to figure out, do you think in Berlin and with the Club Commission, is it even ever an issue to talk to clubs and the bigger picture of their whole structure? Um, it is. I mean, that's, I guess, the core of my, my work I'm doing there. Um, but maybe just uh, to refer to something you said, like to the term of safer spaces, I think uh, as well it's maybe a good idea to replace it uh, with something like intentional space, like really like what's our intention when we create this space, because it makes clear that there's a certain responsibility as like someone who runs a club, a collective, who creates parties or who ever has any, you know, like task in that, we have a responsibility on how we create the space, uh, what we decide for, who we invite, and which kind of, you know, like code of conduct we apply, how we take care of each other, and what are our consequences if something is going wrong. And I think that's really missing, that a lot of clubs and, I don't know, promoters, collectives, they don't really have this kind of, you know, like idea on, yeah, what is actually, how do we consider when something is going wrong as something wrong? And what do we then in the aftermath? How do we treat it? What is our ethic behind it? So, um, and I think it is changing really as well. Um, there's a lot of work to do. I totally agree. Like, it's really endless right now, but still things are moving. And as well, because of the, yeah, overaching society that is changing, you know, like people are more aware, um, suppressed voices, raise their voices, they point out problematic situations. And we see this a lot in club culture. And we as club commission with the awareness academy the project i'm taking care of we really try to create conditions and structures in order to give them like club owners club stuff door stuff possibility to educate themselves um, to learn uh, in these fields um, and as well to have a dialogue and exchange between them because they can learn a lot from each other but it's as well segregated there you know like every club is doing their own stuff but they don't talk to each other because they th this is like this very n neoliberal you know mindset like this is our thing we are fighting for um, for our position, but actually they could really change something at if they would work more together and exchange more. And we see this in all like uh, the offerings we are doing. Like we do a lot of workshops that are always, you know, like oriented on what clubs are asking for or what is right now the issue in the scene. What are we talking for? So we had a lot of. Um, um, workshops and trainings on racism in, cl in club culture and how can we change our communication, how can we take care of each other, how can we um, yeah, be more responsible. Um, sexism, sexualized violence is a huge topic and as well like classism, ageism, all these things going on. So there's a lot for all of us to learn and all we can do is like really just offer 
um, options. And I think a huge problem we see is um, that there is a lack of resources. Like uh, working in club culture is precarious itself. It's like not paid well, um, um, the working conditions are problematic and um, as well, you know, like the mental, physical and financial capacity to, to train your stuff, um, to make this possible is really um, challenging. So we try really to um, have like a program that is for free so whoever wants to attend, who is an actor in the scene can attend and that's what we are doing ongoing. And who does attend? Out of curiosity, the fact that yeah. it's available, how do you communicate it to people, to the community, yeah. to everybody who so through needs it? Because often I find yeah. in these talks, the people that are aware of these things mm -hmm. are not actually the people that need to learn. <laughs> That's pretty cool <laughs> that you are asking this because um, I'm doing this now for two years. So we started the Awareness Academy as kind of an institution two years ago. And the thing changed, like the whole, like, yeah, situation changed. So in the beginning, we really had to run after club owners, club workers. Like here, we have this like training on awareness and sexism. Don't you want to attend? Um, we would call them, nobody would attend. And then it really changed. Like from in the beginning, we had like just like the very woke and aware people who are already doing the work in the clubs. And now we really see it's more diverse, like really people who have um, never dealt with this topics are coming now, club owners are coming now, and I think it's as well because they, um, we kept on doing this work and we never got tired communicating it all over the place, and people would attend, would tell other people, and as well, you know, like it raised kind of a trust. So in the beginning, a lot of people were like, okay, like this is public funded money, you are giving us this trainings, now you want to teach us something, this is totally against like the essence of club culture, as well we don't want to, you know, like expose ourselves to the government, like all these kind of uh, suspicion we could see there. So it really changed that they're now realizing, okay, this is just something we can use for our ad advantage and we can really change something and as well you know like society is working for us because they realize we have to change something in order to be ready for the future and to be still there that's so really certain comforting. factors coming together it's really comforting to actually know that that's happening mm -hmm. i don't know if it's happening in many other cities but really impressive that you guys are doing that um and it kind of brings me to the point of the fact that we always, it's always the same people, you know? It's kind of, it's artists, activists, and mm -hmm. audiences with these academies and going to them. But I, we, we should talk about what role can scientists, politicians, and the industry play as a whole. Um, and what you already touched on is it's great that this academy is happening, but I'm also curious before we move on to that point, how many people have attended the academy? Oh, that's a good question. So we have like workshops going on every month and each workshop has like between 20 and 30 people. So over um, a time frame of two years, it's a lot. And sometimes you have even more in one month. So this month, for example, is very busy. We have like four trainings on different fields like um, um, violent free communication, um, critical masculinity, um, awareness training and bystanderism, stuff like this. So, and it's always totally overbooked. So that is really what changed as well. You know, in the beginning we would really have to find people to attend and now we have like a waiting list. We could fill three other trainings. So you could, can really see like the landscape changing. Mm. That's, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, so, yeah, going back to my question, and I interrupted myself asking you about the numbers, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but what role can scientists, politicians, or the industry play, Sebastian? Well, I think hearing what you were saying right now, which is very encouraging to hear, encouraging. Um, I think, so I come from a background of, of queer studies and, and, and feminist studies, and like we, what we hear in the media most of the time is that those niche programs or those niche studies are actually something always in the ivory tower, and no one is caring about this, and actually it's completely disconnected from like the rest of the population, which is not true if we look at actually grassroots organization and things that are happening in those kind of communities. And I think that the teaching moment that you were talking 
talking about is very important. They're like understanding that communicating between each other means that we're not always trying to just make statements and proving points, but that we have a dialogue. And I think scientists can bring that a lot. Like we can, we can bring the various studies that we have been writing, the different kind of topic that we've been discussing and bring other people in the conversation as much as we learn as well from people on the ground. So there's a, there's a, there's a dialogue here that's very important and it breaks this idea of liberal progressive wokeism that is actually completely disconnected from the population, which is, which is not true because people actually want to have joy and want to dance and want to wanna feel safer. Um, so I think there's, there, there's that. The, but at the same time, I mean, there's a lot of, of survey that are being done in university. There's a lot of, of studies that are being done. There's a, there's a dialogue here. It, it, it's very encouraging what you're saying, basically. Mm -hmm. There's a survey that you talked about in our prep for this panel. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, right now we are working with our Project Awareness Academy at a, um, uh, on a survey. We will release it uh, beginning of next month or end of this month, um, which is basically researching um, incidents of discrimination and the systematic and quantity of it in Berlin club culture and as well uh, how it's connected to individual satisfaction and as well um, what is like the social significance for individuals of club culture. So in order to see, yeah, what are we actually dealing with? Where um, are things going wrong? In what way? On in which dimension? And but as well, what kind of you know, like value has club culture at the same time? Because it's it's always these both sides. It's um, it's like a safer space or intentional space for marginalized communities. At the same time, we we know the reality of discrimination going on, especially against um, these kind of groups. And so we really want to see the balance between and as well, you know, like where are really the problematic points in the club where we have to do something about it, but especially what can do science so we can create facts, uh, scientific facts, and then we can work with these kind of facts, you know, we can publish them, we can say this is the reality, um, and then we can go, you know, like to the government and the t to politics and say, and in order to change something or in order to preserve these facts, uh, preserve these facts, we, we need that. We need that kind of resources, we need that kind of fundings, or we really need to have this like public discussion. So it can, I think it's a really fruitful connection and it should happen way more. And as well, the number you said in the beginning, you know, like the economical... It, it comes from our club culture study we, we released uh, in the end of 2018. Oh, I was you. So do call Not me, me <laughs> but uh, <laughs> like a very ambitious team in, in, in the club commission did that research. And uh, I mean, it was, I think, groundbreaking in that term that we then had like this economical facts. Uh, besides, we were like um, researching on social dimensions, um, cultural dimensions, and stuff like this. But the economical factor we had then as a fact was really important in order to be able to address a lot of people in powerful positions to say, okay, like this industry is an industry, it matters, it's a huge number, um, and at the same time it's a culture and it belongs to each other, but we really matter, so to not lose it, you ha we have to do something all together. And so, yeah. So these surveys, oh, sorry. If, if, sorry, if, if, if I may add to this, I think that like when we talk about science and we talk about surveys, we, all, we, we often think about uh, quantitative um, mm -hmm. research, but I think qualitative research is also important. So you're mentioning um, th this amount of money, what was it for? Eight, four four eight, eight, eight billion. billion. So there's the economic aspect, and this is very important. Those facts are very important, but you were also mentioning a lot of like the spiritual aspect of the dance floor. And I think if we look at qualitative research and we show how emotions and feelings of belonging are important in the club culture, then there's other way the politics can also look at the importance of club culture and not only just hard facts which are important, but also like other kind of facts that are based on other kind of research which are as scientific yeah. as the other. A hundred percent, yeah. But how do we take these, this research and these findings and turn them into change? In Berlin specifically, do you have open ears in the government? I know yeah. the fact that it's all linked, but with the change of government too, I'm just curious 
how the process I, is. I really think that changed a lot, like how the club commission has an ear from the government, especially through the pandemic. We really became like a voice for a very diverse and decentralized scene. Um, and it's very complicated, you know, like to communicate needs of that kind of um, group um, that is made of so many places. Um, to one direction, so that's where the club commission comes in and is kind of making translation work for the needs uh, towards um, the government, and that could really it really brought a change. I mean, we have had we we see all the help clubs got, even though it's still you know like existential crisis, but there has. Uh, there have been a lot of security um, and support mechanisms, but this is just because there were people talking and doing the work day to day, day to day, and convincing and saying, okay, this is the situation, this matters, we need this. Um, and I think this study I was mentioning before, the club culture study, with all these hard facts, it really um, reached the ears of the government and changed something. I mean, it was all over the press, this number, because it was so impressive. And um, it's just a number, but it was really powerful, I think, yeah. And do you see this positive aspect yeah. from the top continuing with the change of government in Berlin? So, ri yeah, right now we are in, 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 in that situation that we have, like, a good way of communication with the government. and. But it's constantly changing and it's always a process and you have to always renew it. And um, especially now, we don't know how the government of Berlin will look like. It's still, you know, in the process of finding itself. Um, but the last four years, we have been in a good situation so far that we had like a good relation with the Cultural Senate, who was um, like understanding the needs of club culture because we were lucky that this was kind of a part department who have been to a club before and who know what is doing uh, it is doing to the people there. Um, but most of the time we have this problem that people are talking about club culture, but they have actually no idea what they are talking about. So really like research about this and making this clear is changing something because people can understand and we can make people in powerful situ like positions make understand. And yeah. Maybe they could hold parliament in Bergheim? <laughs> <laughs> and maybe yeah, they could I think we are very far away <laughs> from that. I mean, we have still all the stigmatization going on with club culture and... I agree. Um, yeah. I wasn't serious. <laughs> <laughs> um, we haven't got long left, so as much as I would love to carry on talking about this, I don't know if any of you would like to add to any of those points. I just, I just want to add one, one mm -hmm. thing. And when we're talking about the dialogue between science and club culture, we all should also see like the, the kind of entanglement between all of this. I mean, I am definitely not the only scientist in Berlin who's going like in, during the weekend dancing on the dance floor. And there's enough students who are also dancing. So I think there's already a kind of, of conversation happening that needs maybe to be a little bit more um, built and, and, and constructed. But that's just a synonym. But, uh, but yeah, but we're, we're a bunch of, of scientists who are also part of the community as well. Maybe just to add this, so this uh, survey we are preparing right now, we, we did with the support of a researcher and psychologist from the university in Bielefeld, uh, Zeynep Demir, and as well with the House of Research in Berlin, and as well we work together with the university. But I really think that this can happen so much more, and yeah, I totally agree with you. <laughs> Great. Sarah, anything to add? Um, I would add that DJs also have a responsibility and um, producers because we are talking more about clubs now, but there are people who are making the music and profiting off of the music. And I mean, this is a whole nother panel probably, but um, <laughs> I yeah, just want to encourage people, music lovers, DJs, producers to um, go on the journey to learn where the music comes from and not just take things and sample things without asking someone and just be more aware and maybe work in more um, you know, collaborative ways. I think that's a really important point because 
I think club culture can only survive if everybody takes responsibility for their part in it and how we further it. Um, to finish, I would just like to ask you to share with the audience <laughs> if there was one event, one thing or one experience that you could recommend to people that they should try in relation to clubs or safer spaces, what would that space be? And I think we have three minutes, so <laughs> <laughs> anybody want to start? I can start with just what's com what comes to my mind and what I rediscovered lately is um, the Monster Ronsons Club in Friedrichshain and um, it's, it's a karaoke club but it's holding amazing drag shows and especially they're always happening every Tuesday and I would really recommend everybody to go there and have this experience of community. Thank you. I'm going to be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have like one experience coming to my mind, but I think I would just invite, I guess, people to stop consuming the club culture in Berlin as some kind of thing to perform and to, to say, oh, I've been to that club and I've been to that party, but instead just being more interested in the music and more to interested in being uh, in the in the moment, and it's totally fine if you don't go to the last very trendy club, but you go to the small party where music is also very good. That's actually why I asked the question, because I wanted to go away from somebody Googling where's the best place to go in Berlin yeah. <laughs> for people who actually experience it. And you, Sarah? Come to my party. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, I would just say, personal experience, I would always recommend a sound system. Mm -hmm. A good sound system, because you actually feel the music. And it may sound cliche, but it's really true. I think my spiritual experiences in clubs have always been in front of a sound system, and it just feeling internal, and really hearing the music how it was supposed to be heard. Um, sadly, that's it. We had some questions which we haven't got to. I'm sorry, but thank you for everybody that sent in some questions. And thank you for joining us. And thank you.